MedCram.com. To mask or not to mask? That is the question. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. For about 700 days now, we've had a mask mandate that has been imposed by the federal government in the United States, and it requires us to wear masks on airlines and in airports. On April 18, 2022, Judge Mizell, which is a federal judge, struck down the mandate as unlawful, number one, because it exceeded the statutory authority of the United States CDC, and number two, implementation violated administrative law. So we're not going to talk about the politics of this or whether or not this was legally correct or not. We're simply going to look at the data and decide whether or not you as an individual should wear a mask regardless, because it sounds as though the decision is going to be left up to you. And for that, we're going to have to get into the science. So one of the things that you have to understand is that COVID-19, which is caused by SARS-CoV-2, is spread in primarily two different ways. And the two different ways is number one, droplet, and number two, aerosol. Now, both of these are particles, but you have to understand that droplets typically are larger than five micrometers. That's a pretty small, but it still is larger than aerosol, which is even a finer particle, which is usually less than five micrometers. Now, because the droplets have larger particles and the aerosols are smaller particles, Typically, the larger droplets will only go about six feet or less, whereas aerosols can travel greater than six feet in terms of distance. Furthermore, the thing that you have to understand is that these droplets are several orders of magnitude larger than the individual virus particles themselves. And that's the reason why typically masks will work when it comes to droplet transmission. They will prevent droplet transmission because the holes in the masks are able to hold on to these particles, which are fairly large. And that could be because the holes are smaller than the particles. It could also mean that the material that the masks are made out of have electrostatic charges that attract the particles. It could also be because the particles themselves may have something called Brownian motion, which causes them to bump into those masks material. Masks, as I said, are pretty good at preventing droplets. That's pretty safe science. However, with aerosols, these are very, very small particles, very fine mist. And unfortunately, masks don't seem to work very well in these type of particle transmission. This is a very fine mist that can go through the mask. It can come around outside of the masks. It's like tobacco smoke. It's so fine, it's so small that masks don't seem to work. And what does work, especially on planes, is ventilation. And ventilation works very, very quickly. In fact, the ventilation that we see in airplanes works so well that the entire cabin can be turned over in about two to three minutes. The air that's coming through the vents is usually 50% coming from the outside, which ostensibly <laughs> at 30,000 feet or wherever the plane happens to be is devoid of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the other half of it is recycled, but it's recycled through HEPA filtration. So you can clearly see that when both of these types of strategies are employed together, they will both effectively take care of the particles that they're supposed to take care of. And what we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic essentially is very, very low transmissibility on airplanes of SARS-CoV-2 virus. In fact, here's a paper that was published in the Annals of Medicine back in 2021 titled Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 During Air Travel, a Descriptive and Modeling Study. And specifically, the purpose of this study was to explore the potential of SARS-CoV-2 spread during air travel and the risk of in-flight transmission. What they were specifically looking at here were international flights. These are very long flights specifically 13 hours of air travel. And what they found after they screened about 4,400 passengers and crew suspected of having COVID-19 infection, the verified 161 confirmed cases and traced two confirmed cases was that the risk of per person infection during a 13 hour air travel in economy class was about half of a percent which is extremely low. We found that the universal use of face masks on the flight together with the plane's ventilation system significantly decreased the infectivity of COVID-19. 
So the question is, is what happens if we completely eliminate one prong in this dual pronged approach? Will ventilation do all of the heavy lifting and prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2? So here's an interesting article that was published in October of 2021, but it was actually looking at the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 on air travel and a specific incident that was way at the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020. And this was a specific incident that happened on a two-hour domestic flight to Okinawa, Japan. And this was published in the Influenza and Other Respiratory Viruses journal, Open Access. So let me give you a little background on this case. On March 23rd, 2020, a man who was the index case in his 30s developed fever and cough. And the same day, he traveled to Naha Airport in Okinawa, which was a two-hour flight with intense cough, and he did not wear a mask on the plane. At that time, there was no mask mandate in Japan. This was a Boeing 737-800 with 177 economy class seats. There was a total of 148 total souls on board, including crew. And this was a fixed-wing commercial aircraft, very similar to this plane here that you see. This flight was confirmed to have a HEPA filtration system that was in place, and in fact, it had just been changed a month prior to that on February 15, 2020. The next day, this index case went for testing and was found to have a CT value on PCR testing of 18.8, which shows a fairly high viral load. By March 26, authorities were notified of the situation and they investigated the case. And just so you are aware, the inside of the cabin was very similar to this 737-800 with a 3 plus 3 configuration. So of course what they did at first is they investigated and got the information of the name, age, sex, seat assignment, and telephone number from the passenger manifest. And you have to understand that generally speaking when they investigate, they typically look at the two rows in front of the index patient and the two rows before, but they started to get information that there were other people on that plane that were coming down with SARS-CoV-2. As you can see here, they said, however, because symptomatic passengers with positive PCR test results were reported by the health departments of another prefecture or another area in Japan, we expanded our contact tracing as shown in figure one. And you can see in figure one exactly how they did that. We'll give a link to this article in the description below. In the initial investigation, we interviewed 82 out of all 141 passengers between March 26th and April 6th of 2020 and the passengers were notified by telephone about their potential exposure to SARS-CoV-2 infection and were asked to self-quarantine and self-monitor until April 6th, which was 14 days after flight travel. We advised them to consult with their local COVID-19 consultation center if they experienced any symptoms, and we requested the airline to inform flight attendants in the same manner. So while they did the generic public health responsibility things, they also wanted to follow up investigating to see whether or not there was any association between who got infected and who was wearing a mask and how far they were sitting from the index patient. Now, this is important to understand because, again, at this time, there was no mask mandate. So some people were wearing masks on the flight and some people were not wearing masks on the flight. And some people were close to the index patient, and some people, of course, were far away. So this gives us actually a really good insight into what would happen if people are not wearing masks on a flight that has a HEPA filtration like we have today in the industry. The other thing, however, that we should note in this case is that this was at the very beginning of the pandemic with the initial and original strain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Obviously, with the strains that we have and the variants that we have today, specifically Omicron, which is several times more contagious or infectious than the Alpha variant, which was more infectious than the original, we can say here that the findings might be different in terms of infectivity because of the type of variants that we have today. So as you can see here, what they did was they went back and they followed up with the passengers and flight attendants exposed to the passenger with COVID-19, and they developed a questionnaire, a validated questionnaire specifically. And one of the things, of course, that they looked at was seat assignment, face mask use during the flight travel, whether it was always, most of the time, or never, or did not have a face mask, cannot remember, or others. 
symptoms of illness, whether they had fever or cough, nasal discharge, obstruction, sore throat, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, headache, myalgias, arthralgias, hyposmia, or hypogusia between March 23rd and April 6, 2020. And these were the results of the study. As you can see here, we have the seat letters, A, B, C, and then we have the aisle, F, G, and H, and we have the seat numbers here on the side. The particular person in this case who was the index case was seated right here and is given in black. As you can see here, the areas with lines through them were empty, unoccupied seats. So you can see, as it turns out, seems to be a distribution around this index case, so I might say fortunately, that were not occupied by people in this case. But as you can see, those that have darkened in shades were passengers either that were confirmed cases that were not included in a genome analysis, confirmed cases who were infected with the virus that were identical to the index case, or confirmed cases that only had one nucleotide variation from that of the index case. We have passengers on the flight that came down with a virus almost identical, if not so, to the index person. So as we mentioned, they then looked at the distance to that index case and whether or not they were wearing masks. And I also want to again mention that the index case in this particular case was not wearing a mask. And reportedly, the index case was not wearing a mask even though he was having severe cough. So let's take a look at the result. And if we set those people who wore a mask all the time as a odds ratio of getting the disease at 1.0, so that's the reference, then what we see here is that there were 92 passengers on that plane that were wearing a mask the whole time, and 11 of them developed COVID-19 symptoms, which leaves us at about 12% in terms of the chances of getting SARS-CoV-2. Those that wore a mask most of the time, 20 of them, five developed SARS-CoV-2 with a percentage of about 25%. And so if you look at the odds ratio, it was elevated. So in other words, they were numerically at a higher risk for getting SARS-CoV-2 if they only wore it most of the time. But as you can see here with the 95% confidence interval, since it included the number one, this was not statistically significantly different. All right, let's go on to those who did not wear a mask. There was 13 people on board that did not wear a mask. And remember, this was before mask mandates on this flight. Of those 13 people, five came down with SARS-CoV-2, which was 38% of those people, elevating it to 4.6 times more likely to get infected with SARS-CoV-2. And you can see in this case, the confidence interval does not include the number one, meaning that this was statistically significant. So there was a statistical significant difference between those who wore a mask all the time and those that did not wear a mask all the time on a plane with a HEPA filter. And if we adjust this for the odds ratio of, as you can see, adjusted for wearing a face mask and maintaining distance from the index case simultaneously, you can see that this number actually goes up to 7.29. And again, pretty extremely statistically significant, as you can see. If we look at just simply distance without looking at face masks, there are those that sat beyond two rows and those that sat within two rows. Obviously, there's a lot of people that sit beyond two rows because you can only get so many people within two rows, 111 and 14, and respectively, 15 came down with SARS-CoV-2 and 6, showing a percentage of 14% of people who were sitting beyond two rows coming down with SARS-CoV-2 and 43% of those who were sitting within two rows coming down with SARS-CoV-2. And as you can see here, there was a statistically significant increase in that. Leaving us to say that the things that predisposed people to getting and contracting SARS-CoV-2 from an infected person on a plane, in this case not wearing a mask, is if you happen to be sitting within two rows of that person, and if you, the breather, are not wearing a mask. Now, some interesting points that the article points out is that SARS-CoV-2, again, can infect both via respiratory droplets and infected microaerosols. This is exactly what we were talking about before. This is number one that we talked about, and this is number two that we talked about, and that the index patient was not wearing a face mask and was coughing. The thing that they mentioned is if you look back and see where this person was sitting, you'll see that he was sitting in an aisle seat. Now that's interesting because if he was sitting here in the aisle seat, one of the things that you have to understand is circulation on the plane 
comes down from the ceiling, but then goes this direction and gets sucked in to the side where it gets collected and filtered and then put back up into the ceiling. And so in effect, the person sitting here at the aisle is upstream of the flow. Now, this return is usually down in this area here low. So that return flow is usually going down low. In essence, the person sitting in the aisle is upstream and usually the flow is going in this direction towards the side of the plane. So it might be a logical conclusion, although I can't tell you definitively if this is the case because I don't have randomized controlled trial data, that if in fact this is the flow that is predominant, it might be better to sit in the aisle seat if you want to avoid downstream transmission of SARS-CoV-2. I want to stress again, however, that is a possibility, and I don't have definitive data on that. But I also want to mention as well is that this return flow is usually pretty low, and our mouths and noses are usually up in this area. The article also makes an interesting statement back in October of 2021 based on the data that they had seen, and they say this, quote, additionally, a universal mask wearing policy in the plane must be discussed in this COVID-19 era. Using a face mask during flight travel effectively decreased the risk of acquiring SARS-CoV-2 infection in our study. Some recent studies have suggested that wearing masks is beneficial not only to prevent the spread of the virus from infected people to others, but also to provide personal protection. As IATA pointed out, which is the International Air Transport Association, most reports published to date and our study indicated the potential for in-flight transmission of COVID-19 in the early stages of the epidemic before control measures such as mask wearing were implemented. So based on this understanding of a two-pronged approach in reducing transmission of SARS-CoV-2 on airplanes, I would still wear a mask on a plane. That's not to say that I would shame other people into trying to wear one as well, because I don't know the personal and medical problems of everyone on that plane. As far as the science is concerned, it makes sense for me to wear a mask. And you have to remember that I am a physician and I wear masks for up to 12 hours a day when I go into the hospital. So for me, wearing a mask is not a big deal. I must also say that in the past, when I have done air travel prior to the pandemic, I always seem to notice that air travel was always associated with some sort of upper respiratory illness afterwards on some occasions. Even if it's not SARS-CoV-2 that I'm trying to prevent, there is a whole host of other viruses and things that happen on that plane. And so wearing a mask may be beneficial in that sense as well. And if you want more information on this and other health topics, don't forget to visit us at medcram.com. You may be a healthcare provider looking for continuing medical education units or just simply curious. Either way, we have a number of courses that will interest you and give you the information that you need. Thanks for joining us.